There are many airborne viruses. The length of time they remain infectious in the air will affect the likelihood of transmission. Now to estimate risk, we have to need to know how long the viruses remain infectious in the air. Aerosol are a unique microenvironment. So this means that to understand what a virus is doing inside an aerosol, and what happens to a virus in the aerosol, you have to measure it in the aerosol. And this can be challenging for a number of reasons. Incredibly small sample size. How do you contain a plume of aerosol in a confined space? How do you measure what's happening to the virus inside the aerosol within this space? None of these, none of these problems have simple answers. And so all, you need to consider all of them when you're designing your experiment. And so in this video, I'm going to give a brief overview of the history of how people have studied airborne viral decay. Additionally, I'm going to discuss some of the challenges associated with these techniques and how it's led to some confusion during the pandemic. Anytime you make a measurement, you'll be making some assumptions. All of these assumptions have consequences. Consider the following analogy. Let's say I want to measure the growth rate of elephants. To do this, I'll measure their mass over time. So I pick up a bathroom scale and I head on down to the zoo. And I start measuring the baby elephant's weight over time. The data I collect will look something like this, where there's variation in the initial mass and the growth rates, but surprisingly, the final mass of them all will reach the same, 300 pounds. So I go ahead and publish my findings. And another person reads this and thinks this is nonsense. So they go out and buy a better bathroom scale and redo the study to prove me wrong. And to their surprise, the data they collect largely agrees with what I've reported. So now, instead of one study, we have multiple studies all reporting similar results. And so this is great for many reasons. First of all, they, all these studies are indeed measuring elephant mass. Moreover, they're in agreement with one another. So now we're reaching some form of a consensus. And objectively, the growth rates from zero to 300 pounds is outstanding. Now, the obvious problem here, of course, is that we're not measuring what we set out to measure, which is the elephant growth dynamics over their entire life. And so by assuming the maximum mass would not exceed the scale that was used, the utility of the study has been limited. Again, the data isn't wrong. It's simply only valid from zero to 300 pounds. And that is okay, as long as you know this when you're interpreting the data. So what does this have to do with airborne viral decay? Now, as mentioned earlier, the decay of an aerosolized virus is an exceedingly complex process to directly probe. Here are just some of the unique features of an aerosol. So, when people first began to study airborne viral decay, what were their assumptions? Where, where did they set the limits? So to answer that, we need some historical context. Now, measuring airborne viral decay began during the Cold War. While the threat of nuclear weapons was well understood, the threat of a bioweapon attack was also of great concern. So for example, if there was a large scale bioweapon attack in the English countryside, how many hours, days, or even weeks would have to wait before the area was safe? To answer that question, Goldberg and his team developed the Goldberg Rotating Drum. The Goldberg Drum is essentially a rotating drum that has a wedge on the inside that creates a draft that helps it to keep any aerosol within it suspended for prolonged periods of time. It works by first nebulizing in a solution that contains the virus. Given the large volume of the drum, the sample is nebulized for a significant amount of time. Once the drum is loaded, time is given for the internal volume to equilibrate. A volume of the air is then extracted from the drum. This can take a few minutes. The collected sample is then probed to measure how, long, how much virus is still infectious. This final step is repeated multiple times from the change in viral infectivity, the decay rate can then be extrapolated. Okay, so what are some of the assumptions that have been made? Well, the aim here is to measure the total viral decay rate. Okay, well, it takes 10 minutes to load the drum, it takes five minutes to equilibrate, and another five minutes to sample, meaning there's 20 minutes where there is no information about what is happening to the virus. The user has no idea about the dynamics of the virus during this time. After 20 minutes, the data ought to be very good. Now, remember the original aim. They're trying to see how many hours or days people need to wait before an area is safe after a bioweapon attack. To them, what happens in the first 20 minutes doesn't much matter. The longer timescales are the concern, meaning the approach they're taking here is valid for what they're trying to achieve.
The question then becomes, is this applicable to respiratory disease transmission? For example, the initial viral load <laughs> from an exhalation is much, much smaller from a breath than from a bioweapon. Also, the vast majority of transmission is going to happen over short distances and short time periods. So what happens in the first 20 minutes of aerosolization becomes incredibly important. Let's leave that aside for now and look at the viral decay data for SARS-CoV-2 that's being measured with a rotating drum and reported in the literature. If you search online for how long SARS-CoV-2 can survive in the air, a couple of numbers always pop up. A half-life of 1.1 hours, and it can survive in the air for 16 hours. While the rotating drum is the standard technique used to measure viral decay, how they are actually used is not standardized, meaning that every part of the technique can be altered. Consider the various studies that have been measured the decay rate of the original wild type strain. They all use different nebulizers, the drum volumes are all different, the loading and sampling times are all different, but at the end of the day this shouldn't matter since they are all measuring the same biological phenomena, the decay rate of the original strain at relative humidity around 60%. So let's look at the data. So the first study, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, reported a half-life of about 66 minutes. This is where the results reported in the Google search come from. What is not discussed as much is the error around the curve. According to the study, the half-life is somewhere between a half hour and almost four hours. Now for context, if 99% of the viral decay was needed for a space to be safe, according to this data, somewhere between three hours and a day would be required before the, safe, the space is safe. This variability is not helpful. Well, actually, it is helpful in that the large error ensures that the reported half-life agrees with any study that reports a decay rate between these values. Now, in September 2020, it was reported that SARS-CoV-2 could remain infectious in the air for 16 hours. This led to a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. This is the data from the study. In reality, they aren't reporting decay at all rather a flat line, if not viral growth in aerosol, which is impossible. Also, they didn't repeat the experiment since there are no error bars. In short, I don't really know how this made it through peer review. Anyway, from their data, they report a half-life of around what I believe comes up to about six months. This obviously disagrees with the previous measurements. The final two studies report, again, very different decay rates. These are the reported values of the original strain of SARS-CoV-2 that have been measured with a rotating drum. These have been done by world leaders in the field, published in high-impact journals. These numbers are wildly different. This is a problem because we need to know this value to model transmission risk. And as problematic as this seems, it's actually weirder. The first study and the last study were done by the same research group looking at the same strain using the same instrument under the same conditions and they get wildly different results. What is happening? In short, a rotating drum isn't a bathroom scale. Airborne viral decay is a complex process that's affected by many factors. Each of these experimental processes affect every aspect of viral decay. For example, the length of time that you nebulize into the drum will affect the air composition of the drum. Likewise, the number of samples you take from the drum will also affect the air composition of the drum. In short, everything matters. Now, remembering the elephant analogy from earlier, what about the issue of time? We have recently reported that SARS-CoV-2 has a triphasic decay profile, meaning that there's a region of time when there's no viral decay, followed by a region of time of fast decay, and finally a region of time where there's very slow decay. Now, given their physical limitations, rotating drums are largely measuring the decay rate in the slow decay region. And much like using a bathroom scale to measure the growth of an elephant, the rotating drum misses a significant portion of the lifetime of the virus. All right, so what can we take away from all this? Well, first of all, SARS-CoV-2 does not survive in the air for 16 hours. It just doesn't. Second, 
It doesn't have a half-life of 66 minutes either. It actually doesn't have a half-life at all. In order for something like viral decay to have a half-life, that means that the aerosol conditions would have to be static throughout. And they don't, they're constantly changing. And as such, the decay rates are constantly changing. So that means that airborne viral decay is both faster and slower and much more complicated than what can be measured solely with a rotating drum. So the fraction of viral decay that drums measure is over just a specific time region, this long, slow decay region I talked about earlier. And this decay rate in this region is largely affected by how the drums are used. So in short, there's a need for standardization for these rotating drums, and also for a deeper understanding of what's actually being measured and what's actually not being measured. So if you have any questions about the, anything I've discussed or any comments, um, leave in the comments below or just ask me on Twitter and Blue Sky. I'm on there a bit. Um, my plan is to make some more of these to discuss the interplay between aerosol and human health. Um, out of the gate, I have a few um, planned that will delve deeper into the airborne viral decay. Um, that's an area I'm currently doing a lot of research on and publishing a lot of work. So it makes a lot of sense to talk about that now. Um, if you find this interesting and there, and there are any other areas um, that you'd like me to discuss, please let me know and um, I'll see what I can put together. And uh, finally, uh, Mix, my, my cat, has all the uh, references used in the video. So uh, yeah, thanks again and uh, thanks for your time.